Bay Cowboy Junction. What's up? Hey, everybody on online campus, so glad you're joining us today. They moved the cameras on me, so they told me to focus on this one, but I know you're over here also. But hey, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Would you guys help me welcome our online campus? So glad you're joining us. Yeah. Uh, listen, I just got back from a great trip. Um, it wasn't vacation. It was, it was work. But that's kind of what I came to talk to you guys about. Because when was the last time you took a work trip? And came back completely refreshed. A work trip, not vacation. Oh, I tell you what, I've seen your vacations with your kids, and that's work too. But I'm talking about a work trip. And I just got back from one, and I'll talk to you about it in a minute, but that's kind of what today is about. We have been talking for the last several weeks about something that a lot of people come up to me and they call and they say, hey, Ty, can we have lunch? I said, yeah. And so they bring their lunch and I bring my lunch. And we meet up in, the, in my office and, and they say, listen, Pastor, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. And, and I begin to ask them why they feel like they're so unhappy. And, and they begin to give me all the reasons that they're unhappy. They've tried this and they've done this and they experienced this and they went for this and they bought this. And it didn't lead to the happiness they thought. And they really just... They just want to be happy. And as we begin to talk, we begin to talk about this. It's not what they expected it would be. Because if you've been here for the last several weeks, and we've been on this for a long time now, we have been talking about this word happy and the words that Jesus uses that doesn't say happy. They actually say all kinds of different other things. Fullness, joy, peace. But we're wrapping this whole series around this word happy. All of those things I just described, fullness, joy, peace, purpose, all of these things would feel so good if we could actually do them, actually experience them. And I'm telling you, you can. You can. But it may not be what you think it's going to be, okay? So for all the folks that have been in every series, every message of this series, I'm glad. I'm kidding. I can't wait to get to today. But if you're joining us for the first time and you're like, what's this all about? Jumping in now is going to be great. But I want you to go back and listen to some of the things we've talked about, and it'll help you understand today. Okay, so what are we going to do? I'm just going to go ahead and dive in, okay? Just pretend every one of you is sitting on the edge of the diving board on the really, 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 really high diving board. And your pastor comes walking out and you think he's going to talk to you. And he's not. He's going to push you. Okay? So if you're here for the first time, we're just going to jump right into this. My guess would be if you've never been to church before, if you're watching for the first time ever, you've probably never heard this statement. And there's a lot of Christians who's never heard the statement I'm about to give. But it has a lot to do where Jesus talks about happiness. Okay? Here's our statement. You ready? As long as you are all about you, you will never be happy. Now, Jesus didn't say this. This is, this is Ty's this is Ty's version of where we're going today. And at this point, if you stand up and leave, we'll all know why. So don't move. Okay? <laughs> hey, if, if, if you leave at this point, we all know it's because you're all about you. No, I'm joking. Your, your, your buzzer's probably going off and it's kids' church saying, your kid needs you now. And you go, I can't leave. It'll be, it'll be all about me. Well, get up. Go. Get up. I'm just joking. Okay? But this is what today's about. And it's not something that your dad probably set you down and told you. It wasn't probably something your mom turned and told you. It probably, when you had your first breakup, of course, you broke up with them, okay, right? This wasn't something that your mom set you down or your dad set you down and said, hey, hey, listen, listen, listen. I know you want out of this relationship, but this is the time to act like a gentleman. This is the time to act like the man that God made you to be, the woman God made you to be. And you need to think about their feelings. And you need to think about where God wants you and what you need to do. But you need to think about them. I'm sure you heard something like this. Hey, if you're not happy, get out of it. Who cares about them? They're not the one. Move on. 
And that was really quick and easy and it made you feel good until someone treated you like you treated them. Ooh, <laughs> no, that's so, I could just dig on that, all the people that broke up with me over the years. Let me just look at you right now. Yeah, no, seriously, this is an amazing sentence. It's something you really ought to write in your Bible. You should take a picture of it. You should look at it later. It should be something you discuss with God all this week, even if you don't believe in God. Let's just stop and pause and let's just think, what if God is trying to talk to you and wouldn't, if you knew there was a God, wouldn't you want him to talk to you about stuff like this? So why not talk to God about this? As long as you are all about you, you will never be happy. And that's really what today is all about. And we've looked at several different things, and, and we've looked at a lot of ways that people are learning how to relive their life, a different view. But today, it really is something important to me because I can truly honestly tell you that this message today is where I really honestly began to find happiness in life. It happened many, 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 many years ago, and I literally quit school, college, don't encourage anybody to do that, by the way, and I quit college, and I went, and I served in the inner cities of Phoenix, and I ran bus routes for years and years and years and years, and the stories I've told over the years, I'm sure y'all are sick of them, if you've never heard them before, come have lunch with me, I'll tell you all the bus route stories, I've got pictures to prove it, and it was just me just looking and asking God, God, I want to be happy, I want to find purpose, can you show me where I I can do something for other people. And I can tell you it started a journey of serving, of serving that has really brought a lot of happiness in my life. Now, over the years, I've learned a few things, okay? And one of the things that I've learned is this. You can't acquire, consume, and exercise your way to happiness. And for some of you, are like, Phew, Good, I can quit Planet Fitness in the morning. No, come on. We all know, we all know that exercise is good for you, right? We know that consuming, anybody like food? I love food. I love food. Food is amazing. And acquiring, I mean, we got bills to pay. We got bills to pay. We got kids to send to college. We, 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 love, we love doing stuff for other people. So acquiring and consuming and exercising, I'm not saying take them out of your life. But where things get unhealthy is when we acquire and consume and exercise our way for our own self and our selfish in, in, in endeavors in life, thinking that acquiring, consuming, and exercising is going to finally make us happy. And it doesn't. And this is only half a sentence. I've thought about this. I've crafted this. I've, I've, I've looked around, and, and I've really come to the conclusion, this is me. You can't acquire, you can't consume, you can't exercise your way to happiness, but you can serve your way to there. And it goes against everything you would think happiness is. Because all of us have been taught at some point, this is going to make you happy. And if you do this, it's going to make you happy. And if you get that, it's going to make you happy. And then we've added on top of the things. We've seen what other people have. And if I could get that, if I could have that, if I could get her, if I could get him, if I could, if I could only have, then I'll finally be happy. And you can't acquire, you can't consume, you can't exercise your way to happiness. But you can experience selflessness, not selfishness, selflessness, and you serve your way to happiness. The University of Chicago did a, 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 a study. It was a really interesting study. They sat down and they asked a question. The question was, who's the happiest at work? Okay. Who's the happiest at work? Because there were so many people saying, I'm not happy at work. I don't like what I do. I'm, I'm, I'm not happy at the job I'm at. And so the University of Chicago just set out to find who's the happiest at work. It may surprise you who was going to work and finding 
fulfillment and happiness. Here was the list. You ready? Top five. Number one, the jobs that included caring for others. Number two, teaching others. Okay? Now, all the teachers in the room are like, hang on, whoa, that made number two. Hang on, go with me here, okay? Caring for others, teaching for others. Third one, protecting others. Yeah, protecting others. Fourth one, creative pursuits. There was only four that showed up. There you go. Creative pursuits. These are the artsy people. These are the folks that, hey, money doesn't matter. I'm just here to be creative. So I love that. That is so great. Why did I do that when I said creative? It was like, like sparkle fingers. That's so good. Yes. Okay. Now, what? caring for others, teaching others, protecting others, and having creative pursuits. So this is a very interesting list because the majority of it is wrapped around serving other people. But one of the things you don't see on this list is a lot of money. Chicago, the University of Chicago went even deeper And just recently, they came out with a a fresh study. And guess what field, what what position came up as the number one happiest job in America? Are you ready? Principal. I don't know how you feel about that. There's a person in the room I'm trying to look at to see if she's here. Principal. And, And they said this. They said that it's not that the job is easy. It's not the job pays well. It's not that the job ha- is just s- so much, I mean, it's just like nothing can go wrong. It's actually the opposite. You have to deal with people. The pay isn't great, and parents are parents. <laughs> but this was the fields where serving people still gave you a sense that I'm making a difference in the world I'm living in. And to these people, they would say, money really is important, but it's not that big a deal to me. I'd rather go to work every day knowing I'm making a difference. And it was just kind of interesting that it came up with these things. Now, with this, what about the eternal value? It's cool that we can look at studies, get Ty's opinion on it. But let's take a look at what Jesus has to say. And ultimately, that's exactly what I'm trying to get you to look at. Even if you're in the room and you don't believe in Jesus, I would hope that you would look at his followers and see a life that was hard and difficult, but they lived a full life and they gave their best. And it showed up in joy and peace. And you can take a look at a guy by the name of Paul. Paul had it rough. I mean, he was shipwrecked, he was persecuted, he was whipped, he was stoned. All the things that happened to Paul, and yet Paul continued to go throughout the world and preach the gospel. He's one of my favorite individuals, and Paul says something. Now, before we look at this, I just want to stop and call a time out. I'm sure some of you have read Galatians chapter 5 a million times, okay? And you see it as the list of don't do's. Today, we're not going to look at this as a list of don't do's. We're actually going to look at it as as a list of something Paul says is never going to bring the happiness you think it's going to bring. And then Paul shifts it and starts talking about something else and where you're really going to find life. Really going to find life. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 19, you may want to take a look at it at home. You may want to study it throughout the week. Galatians is a fantastic book of the Bible. Paul writes, and he says, and the acts of the flesh are obvious. The acts of the flesh are obvious. It's this sinful nature. It's cut off from life, from purpose, from God's creation. Everything Paul's about to express is the acts of the flesh, of selfishness. And it cuts us from everything that brings life, brings joy, and brings God's kingdom. Okay? Now, if we start reading some of these and you go, ooh, that's me. I'm not, I didn't read it so that we could all point fingers at you. All of these could have been me. 
What I'm pointing out is you're going to see a rhythm start happening. As the things we start mentioning and Paul starts mentioning are some of the things I bet you've heard other people say, boy, that'd be fun. We should do that. That'd bring some happiness. That'd make me happy. Okay? And what we find is it's a trap. That only sucks us into deeper unhappiness. You can never be satisfied. You can never be fulfilled. You experience death, not life. And it's not God's best for your life. And then when you finally come to grips, I'm beyond ties preaching, but beyond going to church, this is really God's way of living. And you choose life over death. You're going to find that there's a moment that we have to step away from the acts of the flesh. Paul says they're obvious, and he says this, sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, which is basically um, any sexual desire you want fulfilled, it's all yours. You go for it. Uh, you hear a lot of this in movies and TVs and, and, and things. It just it's imagine your imagination, let it run wild in this area. And the interesting thing about these three things Paul mentioned is they are all self-fulfilling. But the same thing about them being self-fulfilling, they are also people, anti-people. They, they, they have nothing to do with it. We could care less about the other person. This is for my benefit. We could care less about what this does to my wife, what this does to my, hus- to my husband. This is just for my benefit. Forget about my kids. Forget about the person. This is for my benefit. And yes, we would love, we'd love for somebody to, to love us back. But these are totally different. It's for our benefit. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity, and debauchery. And they're only going to lead to death. Paul goes on and says this. Idolatry and witchcraft. This is really interesting. Uh, idolatry is when you ask the gods for anything you want. When you will, I worship you if you'll do this for me. Witchcraft is manipulation. It's like I'm going to get nature to do whatever it is I ask, I need nature to do. Hatred, don't you know hatred makes sense in your mind? But hatred only causes you to hate more people and more of that person. And hatred always seems like the right thing to do. And you're justified, but it's selfish. And it never leads to God's best. And you think, oh, listen, they're not leading themselves to God's best. You can't do anything about them. You can only lead yourself. And hatred is actually self-gratification, discord, Somebody can walk into the room and just mess up unity like nobody's business. They can cause this discord. And and, and Paul says, you know why someone can walk into the room and just cause chaos? For their benefit. For their own personal benefit. There's something about them that is selfish to the point that they'll even make other people selfish and miserable. Jealousy. To be jealous, to want, to hate so much for what other people have. And it's selfish. Fits of rage. Feels good to let them have it. But who did it make feel good? Me. Me. And fits of rage never get us the happiness we thought it would be. I'm just going to walk in and rip everybody's head off. And it never turns out the way we thought it would turn out. In our head, it was like, and everybody will turn and go, you're the smartest person in the world. Oh, my gosh. I needed that butt chewing. Yes. That is amazing. That is amazing. Okay, we'll keep going on here, okay? Selfish ambition. Me, me, me. Because it's all about me. It's all about I. It's all about... That song's too old. Nobody knows it anymore. Yeah. Selfish ambition. Dissensions. Just to rip families in half. I, for someone to say, chaos causes everybody to need me. 
our family chaos causes everybody to run to my front door. Factions, it's, 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 it's a power play, okay? When we power play for our benefit. Paul gives a list here, and none of these things will ever lead to the happiness you think they are. And so now, he goes on. And envy, and drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Okay? But, he says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, and I know, I know probably you, you have it in your mind that all of that preaching on Instagram of you will not inherit the, in, 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 the kingdom of God. And they're talking to you and they're posting for your behalf. And they're, they're trying to tell you, I'm just tired, tired of preachers. I'm tired of Christians telling me how to live my life. Can I just, as a friend, as a friend, can I just say that these things Paul mentioned will never lead to happiness. Okay? But Paul doesn't leave us there. Paul turns around and he says this, but the fruit of the Spirit, this is another way of saying, but God's presence, God's Holy Spirit, God's happiness, okay? And now I want you to watch. It shifts from selfishness to selflessness. And Paul says this is where you're really going to find. It's completely opposite. It's counterintuitive. You're not living for yourself anymore. You start living for others. And it doesn't make sense in your head. You're really going to have to trust God at this moment and let him show you how to do this. But this is where you're going to find happiness. You ready? Love. And love here is not acceptance. Love is here as if you've got that person in your life that is just going to do it their way and they're just going to, they're just selfish. It's just, this is who I am and you have to love me who I am. But you know their way of living is not God's best. Do you write them off? And the answer is no, you know, you, you serve them. You love on them. You, you, you don't quit your love for them. Even though you know they're wrong, you know what they're doing is wrong, it's never going to lead to life. You love them because God loved them first. And it's hard to do. It's hard to do when they are just taking from you and taking from you. But you go to the Father and you say, Father, how do I love the unlovable? And guess what some of the scriptures write about? Is that Jesus says this. He says it's easy to love the lovable. Anybody can love the lovable. It's not faith when you love the lovable. It's actually faith when you can love the unlovable. And when you can love them, you've stepped into the love of Christ Jesus. You're going to find happiness when you can love. Joy. Joy. We talked about joy and peace for the last several weeks. When you start making the decisions... Sowing and reaping and sowing and reaping into choosing peace. You have peace when your bills are paid. You have peace when you are debt free. You have peace when you choose the things that cause peace and not choose the things that cause unrest and no peace. And you get a choice. And when you start choosing joy and peace, sowing and reaping and sowing and reaping, it will take time. But you're going to find that when you start choosing the decisions that lead to the things that give you peace, forgiveness, serving, you're going to find there's life. And there's life more abundantly. We begin to find forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. And it's these qualities to where you could lose your impatience. You could become impatient. But who are you serving when you're impatient? Yourself. And you'll never find happiness there. Paul says, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You don't need a law for these kinds of things. They happen naturally when we live a selfless life. Serving, serving is the area that I want to turn to everyone and say, it will break you from a selfish life. Serving will rearrange your focus from what you deserve to what, what can I do? Serving actually makes no sense in the head because as a server, as someone who's finding a need and filling it, you're constantly being poured out. But that's a part of the joy as God then fills you back up. And you pour out and you fill up and you pour out and you fill up. Let me give you some great key things, what I would think are great reasons to start serving. You ready? One. Greatest reasons for, to start serving. Somebody asked if I would help. Hey, dude, you want to help me? That is a great, some of you should pray. God, I pray that someone comes to me and says, dude, would you help me? Maybe not the dude part, but would you help me would be a good one, okay? <laughs> this, is, this is a great start. It's a great reason to start serving. If somebody ever turned to you and said, hey, would you come help me? You instantly start thinking about whether you can or can't, whether you want to sleep in or not. Whether, you, whether you're going to be missing that day. And what if you just started giving more yeses to opportunities to serve? Another great reason to serve, my friends were serving, so I decided to. What a great way to serve. Turn to your friends and go, what do you guys do around here? What do you guys do to serve? And when a team of friends can go do something together, it even multiplies the happiness way more. Great reasons to serve. Third one, it looked fun, so I tried it. Yeah. Some of the things you're going to see look fun, but they really aren't. Yeah. Yeah. Kids' church may be one of these places, okay? Uh, uh, yeah. Hey, listen, I can tell you that if it looked fun, what if you just tried it? What if someone you saw do something made it look fun and you thought to yourself, if I could do it like that guy, I'd want to do it all the time. If I could greet at the front door like that guy, if I could, if I could make coffee like Sonny Kelton, I'd want to make co coffee all the time. Yeah. Hey, listen. If it looked fun, so I tried it. Another reason to start serving, okay, I wanted to get involved. Here's the fun part about this. I don't know how many people turn to me and go, Pastor Ty, I'm so lonely. I don't have any friends. I said, do you ever get out and make friends? Well, no, I'm kind of expecting them to come to me. And you know what you call that? Selfishness. You want the world to revolve around you. Ooh, this is going to get good. You want your friends to be your friends, but I bet down deep you're not a very good friend. The look I just got, Fabian, you should have saw it. It was great. <laughs> it's one of these moments we have to stop and realize, what if you became a great friend and began to watch the great friends come around you? I just wanted to get involved. Now, these are great ways to start serving. But can I tell you that after you find the joy of making a difference in your world, there's some other things that come up. Here are they. Here they are. The reasons that I love serving now, I feel like I'm making a difference. I thought I could serve and it would make me happy, and I didn't realize that the difference I would be making in somebody's life, and, and yeah, it makes me happy, but I didn't know I was going to make this much of a difference in somebody's life. I, the reason I love serving uh, is being courageous and serving beats fearfulness and self-centeredness. I, I love being courageous, and it sure beats sitting at home thinking to yourself, what are we going to do today? 
Another reason I love serving is I feel like God has made me for this. When you jump in and you dive in and you really see your giftings and your talents and your abilities start coming out, people all of a sudden begin to come up and they go, does anybody know how to do X, Y, and Z? And you go, oh my gosh, I went to school to learn X, Y, and Z. But I didn't know it was going to make me happy. And you start doing X, Y, and Z for someone who needily needed a miracle at the moment. And you became a miracle for someone and you realize, oh my gosh, I feel like God made me for stuff like this. A reason I love serving, I love honoring God this way. It's like, God, thank you for putting me on this earth. Thank you that I get to make a difference in my community. That sure sounds a whole lot different than the guy who says, God, why do you have me here? Why am I living in this town? One of the key things I love about serving, it's not all about me. I'm going to give you kind of what I think is the water cooler moment about today. You may want to take a picture of this. You may want to chew on it and think about it. But here's what I think today's message is all about. The value of a life is always measured by how much of it was given away. Let me tell you, I've done a lot of funerals. I might even do yours someday. But I can tell you this. That I've never, ever gone to a funeral and someone said, he's the happiest dude I've ever met. I mean, his fits of rage made us all happy. (laughs) The way he blew up, ripped us up one side, tore us down the other, it just brought absolute joy and happiness to every family function we had. (laughs) I've never been in the middle of a funeral And a guy walked up and said, hey, Liz, let me tell you, his debauchery took us all to the next level of happiness. I mean, it helped every one of our marriages. It, It made our kids better people. I mean, he led the way in debauchery. I just want to thank God for putting him in my life. That's never happened In 24 years of pastoring, I've never had in a funeral employees of their boss get up and say, someone should always find a boss with selfish ambition like this man had. If you're going to find a boss, find one that is just self-seeking, builds factions, with selfish ambition of greed to the level that every one of us suffered, and it made us all better people. I've never had that happen. But I can tell you this. I've had people bawl their eyes out from the loss of a loved one because of their love and joy and the peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control and they turned and said I was a better person because this person was in my life yeah I think one of the things we can start doing is start walking around and finding a need and filling it it's that easy Why don't you just think for a minute what would life be like if you walked out of these doors and said, God, the next need I see, the next ask I hear, the next thing that comes up that says we really could need help here, I'm not going to ask questions. I'm going to serve. And you start giving God more yeses. You might find that it leads to a life that you didn't even know your life was capable of. That's my alarm to let me know that I need to shut it down, okay? So let me tell you about this weekend. This weekend I had the joy of going hanging out with my buddies in Los Angeles. Uh, Matthew Barnett uh, pastors the Los Angeles Dream Center there, and, and Matthew was down here uh, several months ago, and he called me the next day, and he goes, you got to come speak for us at the L.A. Dream Center. The L.A. Dream Center is a very unique place. It, um, it's in the old City of Angels Hospital, 
we have completely, uh, I guess, refreshed it. It's, it's brand new. It has places where um, single moms in really rough situations can come and live. There's addicts, addictions of all kinds where they come through a, a drug program. A place for men, a place for women. This is a place where they rescue people off the streets. It is a pretty amazing place. It's a hardcore place. It's a really, really hardcore place. To speak there is an absolute honor because they're family. But one of the things that I do is a little bit different than some speakers that come in. I always come in a day early. And I wake up early on Thursday morning and go down to the Dream Center and I just start serving. I load trucks with food, and the boys have helped me, and Heather's gone, and, and Brady and Hud have loaded food. Hudson Bean was so little one time, he couldn't pick up crates of food, but he could count. And he would count his little hearts out, his little heart out, to just be able to, to know that we had enough food. And it was the funniest thing watching this little kid serve. And then we go out on the streets, and we pass out food to the hungry. And while I was there, Matthew's daughter, Mia Barnett, who is home from college. She's a Division I athlete. I've watched Mia since she was a little girl. She runs track, long distance races. She's the number two freshman in the entire nation, uh, Division I schools, in, 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 in her running. And when I saw her come around the corner, I said, Mia, what are you doing here? And she goes, well, I'm, I'm home. I said, I just figured you'd be at school doing summer class. She goes, no way, I, I come home every summer and I serve. I said, man, girl, good for you. And so she went out. I was loading trucks. That night I was speaking. We came back to the church. And Matthew came up to me and he says, you're not going to believe what Mia knocked out of the ballpark today. And I, I turned to me. I said, what would you do? And she goes, well, I went around the corner. And this lady, who I knew she was a prostitute. I knew this is what she did. But she, she, I, couldn't, I, I would talk to her, but she would kind of be pushed off. And I, she, she said, I would, I would try to help her, but her owner would come around the corner and she'd have to leave and it's been this relationship back and forth back and forth well apparently today her boss her owner couldn't be there and this woman was looking for Mia desperately and Mia said she came around the corner she's just serving on skid row she's down there she's passing out food and the girl come around the corner and she says he's not here can we leave now? And this isn't unusual, the Dream Center. They rescue people in, in, in the sex slave addiction, or the, the sex slave industry that's taking place all over the world. And we're so naive here in Lee County, New Mexico. But when you see it and you, you experience the, 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 the awful selfishness of it, and what the Dream Center is doing to rescue people, and this girl comes around the corner and sees Mia, and Mia calls her dad and says, we got to get a spot open at the Dream Center. And Matthew went to work and got a dorm open. And Mia scooped her up. They threw her in the van. They took off driving just in case the man was going to follow her. And here's the thing about the Dream Center. All the security are there are ex-drug addicts and, and gangbangers. <laughs> so it's not unusual for the, the owner, I'm trying to use creative words because kids are in the room, to follow the van. But then they pull into the Dream Center and all these big guys are standing out front like this and then the truck drives away. And then they check the lady, they check the lady in, they got her a room. They started her discipleship program. They started her on a path to get away from a life that she didn't get a choice in. But God opened a door through, are you ready for this? A volunteer someone who was walking with their eyes open someone who chose to go serve her community she wasn't old this girl was 19 years old Mia is 19 years old and every day she got up and she went to the streets and the perfect moment opened up and a woman was rescued sex trafficking and it's one of the million stories that take place when God's people choose to walk with their eyes open and serve 
What if you just begin to find a need and fill it? Find a need and fill it. Find a need and fill it. I think it goes, I think greeting at the door is wonderful. I think making coffee is wonderful. Serving a kid's chirp is, is wonderful. But can I turn to Cowboy Junction, Lee County Citizens in West Texas and say, guys, we've got to get outside the walls of this church. We have got to get out of the four walls of this church. And we have, there are homeless people holding signs up. And the other day I thought, I'm going to go meet one of them. And I hope you join me. I hope, I hope you go get food. Say, hey man, come here. Eat food with them on your tailgate and say, tell me your story. What's going on? How can I help? There's, I just saw 10,000 homeless people in Los Angeles. We've got six in Hobbs. And I wonder if any one of them, of us, even know their first name. Does this make sense? Because we're so selfish and busy and I'm including myself in this and yet God's saying all around us I've given you opportunities to step into selflessness and to find a need and fill it my prayer today as we close is that our eyes would open that we would be a lot like Mia Barnett and just go into the world and to find where God wants us to go and serve people. Serve people. Please, don't be one of those people that says, I'm going to start serving people, so I need to get a, a serving name. Like, we are going to be officially be the, the Jesus servers, and we're going to make t-shirts. And we need a 501c3 because we need to be tax deductible. Oh my gosh. I officially make you nonprofit right now. Okay? Means you're not going to do this for money. So your pastor just made you nonprofit. It's official. It's not legal, it's official. You don't need a title of your serving team, you don't need a 501c3. You just need to be willing to find a need and fill it. And Holy Spirit would love to show you how to do this. And can, I can personally tell you, it will cause so much joy in your life when life's not about you. So Father, today I pray for all of us in this room. Some folks that go to Cowboy Junction, some folks that don't, some here in person, some online, some watching this at a later time and we we step out of our own desires we sit, step out of our own self gratification but Lord I pray today for husbands to ask how can I honor my wife by serving her and wives to say how can I honor my husband by serving him. Same thing for boyfriend and girlfriends, fiancés, and now for our community. I pray, Father God, that you would show us how to find a need and fill it. That life isn't all about us. How can we serve others with love and joy? peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control. Father, today, lead us and guide us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. The prayer team is going to come up to the front. And um, if there's anything pray about or have someone agree with you on by faith they would love to pray with you just come out of your seat while this song's playing walk right up to them and say will you pray for me in this area they would love to pray for you if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior 
And as you were listening to all these things we were talking about today, you thought, I'm tired of this selfish life. Jesus, I need you. I'm ready to follow you. Here's what I want you to do. Reach down and grab your stuff. Okay? We're going to start this song, and I just want you to ease out the aisle and go through those two back doors. I'm going to head that way too, and I'm going to go back to the Jesus side. And I would love to pray for you. Don't miss this moment. To step out of the selfish life and to step into the life of following Jesus. It is the greatest decision I ever, ever made in my life. And it can be for you too. Come on, let's worship the Lord.